Again, I am Kerry Koch. Um, you're probably sitting there wondering what in the world is this young guy doing uh, speaking at the press club, and I think I'm in that same boat asking myself that uh, question. So I'm, I'm honored to be here, and, uh, and it's a privilege. Um, first, I, I do want to kind of tap on the, uh, my background a little bit more. Um, I was born and raised here in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I went to the Dunham School, um, graduated, had a full scholarship to Tulane, and after the aftermath of Katrina, I essentially um, was washed out. I uh, had one a very successful freshman year playing college athletics and then uh, was able to re-recruit myself. Um, went to University of Virginia where I earned my degree in economics and uh, continued my passions to play um, in the NFL for one short stint of a year and then uh, five years in the Canadian Football League, which I just want to clarify that is real football. There's no uh, ice hockey, uh, you know, maple syrup. No, the, the, it's, it's American rules football uh, on a field that is 35% larger. So that's... Uh, yeah, I'll, that's all I'll say. There's a lot more nuances, but that's basically the premise of that. Um, after finishing my first career in football, I decided to take up another uh, blood sport and join Louisiana politics. Uh, working alongside my father, Johnny Koch, um, has been a, a great joy of mine, and um, this leads me to kind of why I'm here today. Um, it was a combination of my growing passion um, for craft beer and also the ability to uh, work with a group of passionate, savvy, entrepreneurial businessmen looking to make a difference in Louisiana. Um, just a, my passion uh, basically began with um, my brother-in-law. Um, he's from Indiana, which is a lush community of craft breweries. He used to ship his beer home before he used to visit here. He would ship a, a package of beer. And, it would get to the door and we're like, okay, uh, you know, my parents are receiving this gift of beer that he's going to drink during the holidays. And, you know, it was, a, it was a pretty big red flag for my parents. You know, t talking to my sister, like, are, are we sure that this guy's not an alcoholic? I mean, this is a big deal. Um, l later did we find out. Now he is uh, my brother-in-law, um, and we welcomed him with open arms. Um, but after seeing his passion for craft beer um, was – was so invigorating and it got me to really kind of invest in looking at Louisiana and why he's shipping beer home when we have craft breweries here so I thought so at that time I kind of was doing my background on what was going on here in Louisiana um, began to research invest time uh, and effort into visiting breweries around the state and um, we, we have been uh, on a trend here uh, that's been going uh, very well over the past few years as far as craft beer is concerned um, my official title is the Executive Director of the Craft Brewers Guild. We, uh, we boast 29 members, uh, 26 are active breweries here today, um, three of them are breweries in planning, which is another uh, membership that we offer for uh, breweries who have not put their roots down, that are allowed to um, in invest their time uh, talking with members and, and figuring out the mechanisms that allowed other breweries to grow. Um, I just want to do a quick poll. Who, who, in this Louisiana, who in this room even knows what craft beer is? Is there a show of hands? Yeah. Yeah, from what I've said, right? Um, for those of you who have not had the privilege uh, after today, I hope that you can enjoy Louisiana products uh, and many of our, our different craft beers across the state. Um, who's ever um, been or toured a Louisiana craft brewery? Yeah, it's, a, it's another great mechanism that uh, a brewery offers uh, bringing people on tours to see how the beer is made, to see the production of it, um, and, and you really learn their stories, which is, which is how they've gotten invested in this um, great business and where you can see that the passion wasn't just overnight this was a decision. This was something they made years and years ago, tons of planning, investment, and opportunity they saw um, as this burgeoning industry continues to grow. Um, what percentage of beer sold in Louisiana is Louisiana craft beer? I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you, it's, it's about 4%. It's about 4% of the market here. Um, that's uh, that's a, for, for a state like Louisiana, who prides itself on uh, culture, uh, business, music, festivals, things that we are passionate about and prideful in Louisiana are, are locally homegrown products. 
Um, this is a uh, staggering uh, statistic that uh, we don't take lightly, but we do see it as an opportunity to grow. We've seen it grow over the last two years, so we are not um, we, we are optimistic that it will continue to grow. Um, we we know Louisianans don't have a problem drinking beer as we're ranked eighth nationally um, in beer consumption. The problem is that we're not drinking Louisiana beer. One night after a national beer conference, everyone went out for a drink. The president of Budweiser stands up and says, I want the king of beers. Give me a Budweiser. Next was the owner of Miller Coors. He says, I want to taste the Rockies. Give me an ice cold Coors. Lastly, Carlos Knott from Bayou Tesh Brewing says, mm, I think I'm going to take a Coke. Everyone baffled by his choice, they asked, why, why would you order a Coke? He responded, I'm not drinking tonight if no one else is drinking beer. This joke, it is a joke, it, but this rings true throughout the craft beer scene, um, that the old adage, beer is beer, is, is just not simply the case anymore. Um, let's take a simple history lesson, I'll, I'll be fast, about where craft beer has been and where we are today. Um, in the late 1970s, the landscape began to change. Um, the traditions and styles brought over from immigrants um, that came to the United States um, were beginning to disappear. Only, uh, it's, it seemed that only light lagers appeared um, to be available because of the, um, call it the effective marketing campaigns, and it really changed America's preference. Uh, therefore, uh, a lower, lower calorie light beer soon began driving and shaping the growth of the uh, American beer industry, even to the present day. So, the only way to get these styles and traditions from beers were for people to brew it themselves at home. So, in 1978, home brewing became legalized. This was uh, the, uh, the pioneers that laid the foundation for craft beer in America. Uh, these, these were beer enthusiasts that took part in the home brewing process that looked to try to create a business um, that was going to be a very hard road um, to come. By the 1990s, there was a huge surge in the annual production, and by 1994, there were 537 breweries in the state. Um, today, we boast 5,300 breweries um, in the U.S. Louisiana is home to only 30. We rank 41st in the number of craft breweries, and we rank 48th in the breweries per capita. So, although we are lagging far behind on national statistics, we'll look at the bright side of this. Um, if we look at the growth in the past five years, we have gained um, 12 breweries in 2012 to 30 today in 2017, with six breweries opening their doors this year alone, and more to come this year. Um, breweries and planning, there's over 30 breweries and planning looking to put their roots down in Louisiana, um, and time will tell if this is the right environment or not, if they're going to stay here or they're going to move out of state. Um, you know, we see it's a huge opportunity for Louisiana to be a part of this growing trend um, that, that's sweeping the nation and sweeping the world. Um, and the benefits from the breweries continue to increase as we see they, uh, they serve as engines of economic development, as, um, as catalysts for entering into markets from rural all the way to urban areas. Um, we see this across our state from corner to corner, east to west, north to south. Um, we see local involvement, investment, support, and passion for a Louisiana product and a Louisiana brewed beer. Um, breweries, um, their, their heartbeat really uh, is obviously to sell beer, but also to make the region a better place. Their local involvement in the communities they bring together with involving as many local products as they can is, is phenomenal. Um, the exotic concoctions they make up with locally, um, local honey, uh, sugar cane, uh, wheat, and um, the list goes on, local coffees, uh, blueberries, strawberries, things that Louisiana is proud of having. They're trying to infuse those locals and give back and keeping these dollars local to the state that we're in. And in our economic times right now, anything to keep money in the state and driving this economic engine is what we need. So the, the one question is, uh, you know, this passionate group of, of enthusiasts that follow these crowds of craft breweries, where are they coming from? What is the deal? I mean, this is a new passion, a new um, a, a new, call it millennials, a, a new season of people chasing after craft beer has, has, has started. And really, they're just chasing on what's the next concoction, what is the next recipe they're going to come up with. 
These people are literally chasing across state lines to find one beer, to come sample one beer, to grab one case of beer. And it's, and it's phenomenal to see the attraction that breweries have across the nation and the world. Thinking of next is something that the Guild and we, we meet regularly. Um, they have an executive board and we also meet four times annually that, that helps our membership grow and, and continue to keep us a cohesive unit. We've seen the strength in numbers um, really come together in this past legislative session instead of breweries kind of acting on their own and doing their own things. Um, I don't, we don't have every brewery in the state, but that uh, doesn't, doesn't prohibit us and doesn't hold us back from, um, from going after things that, that we want. So again, Bill had mentioned HB 610 by Representative Glover um, sought to cancel the current and future contracts that universities would license craft beer. Um, in, in Representative Glover's testimony, he mentioned two of the craft breweries in the guild. Um, we went to the table. We had uh, we, we 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 disagreed with some of the comments that were made that said that uh, what the craft breweries are, are here to promote underage drinking, um, which we absolutely do not condone in any way and form. So. Um, that bill would have caused two breweries to, to lose out on a huge investment that they made to m produce that specific beer more at their facilities and the expansions and things that went into it. It wasn't just this overnight idea. This was a huge agreement that, that was based upon years looking forward. So we also hosted the first annual Louisiana Beer Day at the Capitol. Um, we had 22, 22 breweries uh, sampling beer at the end of the night with a reception held in the Pentagon Barracks. Um, one said this was the largest uh, number of Louisiana breweries pouring at once ever, um, which I thought was a, just a, a great um, tool and, and a really a, a mechanism of how the Guild and coming together is really working to positively impact um, our state, our legislators, people in charge, the agencies. And, um, and that kind of leads me uh, to where we are. And, and at, the end of, at the end of the session, um, we had uh, one of our breweries, we ended on a very high note, um, Louisiana Economic Development uh, honored Gnarly Barley Brewing out of Hammond with the LED Lantern Award, which is awarded to one of the top eight top manufacturers in the state. Um, we enjoyed a presentation um, by Don Pearson, the Secretary of LED, um, Governor John Bell Edwards, and First Lady Donna Edwards, who um, presented Gnarly Barley with the award while the whole night we were drinking gnarly barley on tap and that keg will continue to be there in the governor's mansion until it runs out and we'll provide another uh, Louisiana craft beer once that's done. Um, so uh, that was a huge success for us to be uh, front and center on many multiple different issues. Um, we also sponsored multiple events throughout the session that allowed us to provide Louisiana brewed products for um, all, all the type of uh, events and receptions that were held to promote Louisiana at the end of the day. Um, along with the governor's help and support, we've been working with Commissioner Juana Lombard with the ATC and her staff. Uh, we've been working diligently with her on um, just trying to figure out this mechanism of how, how we want to, how we, um, we see the operation and how the uh, laws and rules and regs are working in this industry and seeing how we can find common ground and find a compromise where we can all continue to grow in this space. Um, we worked hard in the beginning of the year for two months on a, an advisory opinion from Commissioner Lombard and the ATC that allowed, um, strictly dealt with a manufacturer, um, which there, there's a manufacturers and microbreweries, um, two different members of the guild, but this strictly dealt with manufacturers and it gave us some clear guidelines on, on what we could do, couldn't do, and, um, and, and all in between. So we, we, although we don't completely agree with the advisory opinion, we are encouraged that there's something in writing about craft beer in Louisiana. So we are encouraged that we're continuing to take steps forward, and that's a, a very good starting point for us um, to move forward. Um, lastly, on the federal level, the, the Craft Beer Modernization Act is going through um, right now in Congress. Um, we're, we're happy and pleased to uh, tell you that we have one congressman, Cedric Richmond, and one senator, John Kennedy, who's on board and have um, committed to be in support of the bill. Um, this bill seeks to streamline the process for craft brewers, lowers the cost, provides credits to incentivize craft breweries to invest in states. Um, this is a big step for craft beer across America, not just here. We, we want it here, but this will be a big step and a, and a large leap for, for all craft breweries. Um, looking towards the future of this industry, uh, weighing the balance of, of hopeful new laws, new regs that would help, and also the fear that 
more rules and regs will continue to stifle the growth of something that's expanding across the rest of the United States that we want to continue to foster and continue to work with all parties to the table as, as we continue to grow craft beer in Louisiana. Um, the beer industry is changing across the world and, and we have hopes that this state with the best festivals, the best music, the best food, the best entertainment, the best tourism, and good old southern hospitality should continue to be in full support of Louisiana beer. Uh, Louisiana is proud of its products, so I say cheers to craft beer. I'm, uh, I can uh, thank you for your time, and I'm, uh, I'm ready to yield any questions. So the question was, uh, is there a problem or is there a, a mechanism for Louisiana products to get shipped out of state? Um, to get out of state, uh, products have to be going through, there, there's, in a broad sense, there's a, something called a three-tier system. Um, and very, very simply put, if I brew my beer, I can't sell it to, a, I can't sell it at retail to someone. Now there's a lot more that goes into that, but basically there's three buckets. Someone who makes the beer, someone who distributes the beer, and someone who sells the beer, a retailer. So from that point, getting out of state, crossing state lines, there's much more federal permits, some more federal permits you'd have to get as far as labeling and things. There's many more steps in the procedure to get out of state. Um, but if we can't get our home base, our, our, our core nucleus of followers, locals, community involved in the beer, how, how are we going to get outside the lines of the state? I mean, our, our goal has to be that we're going to get our local communities and our state backing us. Because if we're just going out there and just saying, oh, I, well, I'm outside the state, uh, you know, that's up, that's up to a lot more levers to pull. A distributor, a retailer out of state wanting you. There, there's things that has to happen much, much uh, more down the road as a future goal. Yes, I would love for all the brewers to be um, distributing out of the state, but I, I I think that until until we get control of what we can do here to help, I don't think we can actually look towards that as, um, as, as maybe as a 10-year goal, five to 10-year goal. But I'm I'm thinking that most of these breweries are looking; they have to get their home base first and then move on. And yeah, there, there's there's mechanisms to get outside the state, absolutely. Um, so the question was, um, we tried we tried to get restaurants in our breweries. Um, this this has been a uh, a a very recent happening um, where you saw some breweries trying to have an in-house um, kitchen where they were making their own food. Um, in, the, in the advisory opinion that came out, um, up to the discretion of the ATC, they, they ruled that you could have an in-house kitchen if it was up to, it couldn't exceed 25% of your total beer sold. So that's out the door at the tap room. So as long as that, the profit from your food in-house does not exceed your beer sales, you can sell up to 25%. And the problem, the problem with this 25%, it's, it's almost it's an arbitrary number. That was, I don't, the, the agreement on where that came from um, is, is still is still out on how they came up with a 25% number. Um, I know there's rules on restaurants and bars, but it's not 25%. Um, and this is just something that, as you look at other states and other uh, ways, states, um, the best practices, the the states that do it well, we want to mimic them, and, and the 25% is it's something that potential investors look at as um, as stifling something that could be there. If, if there was something in law, black and white, that said we could, could or could not do that, that would be more of a reason that we were we would not be so uh, uh, unhappy with what happened. So uh, we 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 are having the ability though, so we don't take that for granted. We still have the ability to have the in-house kitchen if it's not up to 25%. And we also have the ability to do um, food trucks, any type of food that's uh, brought in not from a licensed ATC permit holder. This comes with concern because most people that cater out, most restaurants that cater out have an alcohol permit of some type. Whether or not they're providing their, only their food, they cannot provide beer, I mean cannot provide their food only at a brewery, which if... Um, if someone had, you know, the goal is to keep growing your businesses and if, if restaurants continue to grow their businesses and food trucks grow into a restaurant, you would hope that they would be able to still come back and, and give back to that local brewery that started their food truck and started their craze of their tacos or whatever that, that great um, economic, you know, driver they, they decided to pick. So I hope that answered your question. No, breweries have not shut down. I think the initial, the initial um, draft or the initial 
advisory opinion came out and stated that it would be 25% of beer sales from the tap room. Right, so that would be a new brewery opening. We do have the ability to sell from our tap rooms or to a retailer through a distributor's contract. So there is a mechanism for us to sell at retail from our tap rooms. But in the first draft, you're right, that the breweries were held to 25% of tap room sales. So it was going tap room to tap room. So if I did have an in-house kitchen, that number would be reached a lot quicker than total beer out the door sales that now has been corrected. What's the average breakdown in terms of percentage of sales? Like what percentage of total sales is going to the tap room? I don't know that exact stat. The question was what percentage of tap room sales versus food sales. What's the percentage there? I don't know the exact difference. I know that as a new brewery starting out, looking to invest in a state where they could have an in-house kitchen, that's a huge bonus for someone to come and lay their roots down to say, look, I can have a thriving kitchen. I can have good beer. We can meet in the middle and eventually distribute all over the state, all over the nation. That would be the goal. But when you see those first initial remarks about beer sales in tap room versus food sales in tap room, you really have to take into question about what's the real goal there of regulating that food sales in-house. And I think we've worked with a lot. I don't think anybody is going to shut down from that first interpretation, but now at least it gives us from total beer sales out the door, it gives us more latitude to work in those numbers. So the question is what are we looking for in association from the state? Yeah, from the state government. So other states and cities, states and locals have their own different mechanisms that you can use. There's incentive programs. We've seen in Jacksonville where they use an incentive program to go to an urban area and put a brewery. And if you go online and see this place now, it's unbelievable the attraction of commerce. Now you have beauty salons and other eateries and other places around it. This just breathes economy and breathes back into the local community that it's in. So there's incentive programs. The Craft Beer Modernization Act will also allow states to further utilize some dollars to incentivize breweries to put roots down in the states. I think one thing that three-fourths, 75% of states do is some form of self-distribution. And this is a topic that's been talked about for probably years, well before I got involved with this. But this is something that 75% of other states do. And we're looking at best practices across the nation to kind of bring to the table what we can do to make everybody happy. As we grow, it's our stance that breweries should grow to the point of distribution. To say that a brewery that brews less than 500 barrels a year needs to have a distributor to push a product in its own region seems a little bit more work for us as breweries and the distributors part because if we're only supplying so much to a distributor to get them to spend that much time and energy on pushing a product that may not be any good in the market, but we want to sell it. We want it to be good. We want to spend as much time and effort that we can. If it means that we're going to start loading up trucks and sending it out, then that will be it. But I think there are states that mimic and have the framework that we can look at. And this is not going to be an easy change. This is going to be pushed back for I don't know how many years. And this is going to be continually the fight that we fight for. But self-distribution is on the horizon. And I think that in some mechanism, some way, we can allow that to grow in a self-distribution manner where if we grow to a point of needing a distributor to look, we've got too much product, we've got too much good beer, we need your help. We're not going to cancel all distributor products. There's still an absolute need and a necessity for a distributor. But there is a point that we can do some work ourselves to get our brand out there. And I think that kind of bleeds into, you know, why is this craft beer movement so strong right now? And I think the old ways of thinking of where your community is was geographical. And now you're looking at community is social media, is a whole new dynamic. We've never seen this before, that you can create an advertisement with me live streaming and it can be viewed a million times. That doesn't make sense to your normal 
uh, chains of advertising and paying for all this advertising when I can get someone to view me and like me enough times to come and view the product that I have for sale. So community is now not race, region, ethnicity, country. It, it's, it's social media world. This is, this is blowing up across, it's not just beer world, it's, it's all the industries that are being affected of this. The model we used to live and thrive in is now being infected by a new form of advertising and social media that's really changing the dynamics of how the, the, the whole economy of the world is, is changing. Yeah, so the, the question is, uh, how do we work with the Louisiana Restaurant Association? Um, I think there was some talk about the Restaurant Association being affected by the percentage of food sales that a tap room could have. I think that was a discussion um, after the fact of the um, advisory opinion. Um, and talking with, with Stan Harris, the executive director, we, we do have a good relationship. I think he wants, he wants to help us continue to grow. I think if we grow to a point where we can be members of the LRA, I think he would be happy. Um, but there, there is, there is an absolute need for every player at the table to be invested in this in Louisiana. I mean, we need to have you know, roundtable discussions throughout um, this interim to figure out if it's, if it's legislation, is it just uh, rule changes, is it new promulgation. So I'm, uh, we, we are definitely open to working with the Restaurant Association and every other association that's, that's been mentioned here. So the Beer Industry League with, with John Williams there, um, you know, the, he supports wholesalers in a different, uh, a different beer economy than what we, what we offer. And so we want to work, we want to work as closely with them as possible. But I think um, just in what, what his membership will need and want are going to be different than what we need and want. Mm -hmm.